בעזרת השם. It says, in the Kavya Yashar Perek Mambav, Ita Bikit Fiyari. He discusses over here different things that make it that a person's prayers don't go up. Person davens, person prays, and a person wants his prayers to go up to be able to be heard. But there are certain things that make a person's prayers not go up, withhold a person's prayers. He says, one, that a person doesn't have a clean body. What does that mean that doesn't have a clean body? Is that there is halachot, that when a person uses the restroom, there are certain ways that a person has to behave. And, uh, so he says people that are not careful with that, that also can withhold back a person's prayer from being heard. He brings also over here, and Davar Melech, when he saw Shaul, when Shaul was chasing him, Shaul wanted to kill him. Shaul wanted to kill Davar Melech. he got a little bit jealous of him. And Davar Melech was a fugitive, he was running away from Shaul. And it says at one point, Shaul wanted to use the restroom inside of a cave. And Davar Melech saw him, because that's where Davar Melech was hiding. And Shaul took off his coat. And Davar Melech took a piece of that coat and he cut it off. So he brings in the Sefer Hasidim, that coat that Shaul Melech was wearing, was an upper coat that would put upon on top of his clothes that he would wear for tefillah and he would also wear lechvod Hashem. It would be a special coat that he would be wearing as cover to Hashem. And, uh, and therefore he took it off of him when he had to go to use uh, the restroom. Right, because it's not respectful for him to be able to wear the clothing that he uses to go pray to Hashem to use the restroom with. And he says also, people that are anshe ma'aseh, people that... I would call them that are very on top of their spirituality. They're very careful in how they serve Hashem. That whenever they would use the restroom, their clothing that they would use for praying, like the top coat and the hat, they would always leave it out of the restroom. And not only that, he says that a Bet Knesset, a shul when a person comes to Daven, is like a Bet Mikdash Me'at. Nowadays we don't have a Bet Mikdash, but we have a shul, a Bet Knesset, which is like a small Bet Mikdash. And he says, therefore, since it's like a small bet of Mikdash, a person needs to be careful when it comes to shul to come with the proper clothing, to come dressed properly. It should be befitting to the covenant of Hashem to be able to come to Hashem's house. Especially, he says, on Shabbat, a person needs to be very careful to be able to have the proper clothing on himself in order to look dignified when it comes to shul. And he says, another thing that can withhold back a person's prayers is if a person is wearing shatnez. If a person's clothing are put together with wool or linen together. If a person has a suit or a person has a wool suit or wool clothing or a wool hat or anything wool that a person didn't check for shot and said, I might have wool and linen mixed, which is a prohibition in the Torah. If a person is wearing such a clothing, it makes it that a person's prayers don't go up. They don't get hurt. A person could be praying, but his prayer gets stuck at where it is. Even if a person is wearing shotness without realizing he didn't do it on purpose, even so his field doesn't get accepted. Even if a person's davening with kavana, it's irrelevant, he says. A person's tefillah does not get accepted. And therefore he says a person should be very careful, especially if a person is a tailor. He should be very careful, right? If he's making a shatnas begit, to sell it only to goyim. Yeah, or to make very careful not to put any shatnas materials into any clothing that he's going to sell to a Jew. This would be uh, very practical for those people that make custom-made suits, right? They would have to be very careful that the materials that are being used inside these suits are not going to be wool and linen, Right? He says another thing, that even if a person is clean and he's wearing nice clothing and there's no shatness and so on, he says there's another thing that makes it that a person's prayers don't get answered to Hashem. He says a person that is not honest in business, a person that cheats in business, a person that steals, a person that lies to people, right? He could be as fancy as he wants, right? But such an individual that comes to Daven to Hashem, for example, he says, imagine a person goes and he lies to somebody. Imagine he sells diamonds and somebody came to him and this is a SI1 and he tells somebody it's a v VSI, what is it? VS2, right? He tells him he lies to him and he knows he's lying. The guy, he buys it and he charges him more for it and he takes that money, right? And he goes and buys himself a nice suit. He says, that suit that he buys himself with that money, that suit in of itself, every time he comes in front of Hashem, reminds him of his sins that he did. Right, so a person like that that lies and cheats in business and he steals, right, somebody like that, his tefillot don't get answered at all. Right? That anybody that has gazel, thievery, right, in his hands, 
of, uh, like the the like the pasuk says that even if you will bring up yantz to Hashem and you will daven, even no matter how much you daven, Hashem says I don't listen to such tefillah when a person has gazel in a sense when a person is this dishonest, right? He says even if a person hired somebody to work for him, right? And then afterwards he try to play him a little bit. I tell him no, I don't like the way you did it. I'm gonna pay you less. You should have done it better. But everything is fine. But he wants to just you know bring him down a little bit. But you already agreed on the price. He did the job that you wanted him to do. And now afterwards, you're trying to bargain and bring him down on the price. Right? It says you're not allowed to do that. You tell him, no, I'm only paying you $4,000, not $5,000. Right? And you know that the guy didn't do anything wrong. And you're just pushing him to the corner to be able to take it. Right? So the guy has no choice. He's going to take it or he's not going to give anything. Right? So such a person like that also, it's a corrupt way of doing things. Such a person who goes down and says, Shem Hashem doesn't answer to fill out. Right? Or a person that has a worker and he doesn't pay his worker. Somebody worked for you for two weeks. Right? And then he comes to you and says, you know, if you could pay him, yeah, yeah, I'll pay you, I'll pay you. And he goes and ignores him, doesn't care less about him. Such a person also, he comes to Hashem, and he comes to Dhamma to Hashem, Hashem also ignores such an individual. That people like this that are that are thieves and that are dishonest, right? No matter how much a person davens, a person Hashem will not listen to such a person. Davening for his children, for Shalom Bayes, for Pranas or everything. The Bore Olam closes the ears to such a person. Right, so to also Right, or a person has a worker that worked for him and he agreed to pay him a certain amount. After the work finished, he gave him half that amount. He said, I'll give you the other half another time. And that's it, he doesn't give him anything. Such a person also. Right, the person needs to be very careful. He says, Right, such an individual that mistreats other people, that mistreats uh, the children of Hashem especially such an individual will be punished for that right, so to also workers they have to be very honest for example if you have people that are uh, cut diamonds or people that make jewelry and you give them the actual material and there's parts and pieces of the material that are left that they don't give back Right, that's also considered stealing. If it doesn't belong to you, the guy gave it to you, you have to give him everything that belongs to him, everything that belongs to him. If you give somebody materials and you ask him to custom make something for you and there's materials left over, he's not allowed to say there's nothing left over. He's, got, he's lying. He has to give you everything back. The person that's a worker himself also has to be very honest. Right, if a person is not honest himself and he t- takes stuff that doesn't belong to him, he's also considered a thief. Right, and go to a mechanic. And you tell him, change my, uh, my, I don't know, what's that called? Uh, on the bottom of the card uh, that makes it soft? It's got what it's called, huh? No. When you go on bumps. Suspension. Suspension, no, under, under the tires. Whatever it is, you tell him, look, I want you to change it for me. My car is a little bit bumpy. Right, he goes, takes it off, fix it a little bit, spray paints it, and puts it back like it's new. Yeah, I changed it. Right, it, uh, I know somebody happened to. Right, that's also considered stealing. That's considered a thief. Or you go to somebody, you tell him to do something, he tells you, you did it, and he didn't do anything. Right? Or he played you, you told him you want the original, and he gave you aftermarket. Right? And he charged you for the original. So, and all these things are considered stealing. All these things are considered being dishonest. Right? Somebody came to you to buy something real, you sold him something fake. Right? All these things are considered dishonesty. All these things are considered sinning and thievery. And such an individual like this, Akadish Brochu, does not listen to his prayers, right? He says, not only that, he says, in the Dora Mabul, the generation of the Mabul, he says, all the Averot they did were bad, but the Avera that stamped and sealed their punishment was the Avera of Gezel, of the Avera of stealing. Once Hashem saw they're already all thieves and all stealing from each other, that was really like the end of it. Then Hashem already like finalized the verdict that this generation has to be wiped out, right? He says, also, right, there is something that not withholds back a person's tefillot from being answered, but creates it that Kiddusha, he sort of pushes away Kiddusha from coming upon him. Something that doesn't seem so severe, but something that seems to be very interesting. It says that Rizal brings that a person should never put on two clothing at one time or take off two clothing at one time. Say if a person has a, has a sweater and a t-shirt, you shouldn't take it off and put it on at one time. You should put on the clothing separately. Explain Kabbalistically how it works and why is it like that, right? But then let's not get into the capitalistics of it, but that's what it is. He says also a person needs to be very careful that he should have a good mezuzah in his house. And not only that, it has to be clean around the mezuzah. 
You're not allowed to put any garbage or anything dirty around the mezuzah. You can't put a garbage can next to the mezuzah. Everything around the mezuzah needs to be very clean, like the Zohar says. That when it comes to Mizdizam, it's there to remind us the chesed of Hashem and that Hashem protects the houses of the Jewish people, right? And a person remembers that, you should always remember the mitzvah of Hashem. He comes to, into the house, he kisses the mezuzah and reminds him that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. It reminds him that HaKadosh Baruch is protecting us, right? He says, also he says, there's a certain demon that stands by the entry of a person's house. There's like a certain demon that stands outside by the entry of a person's house. And he wants to walk into the house to harm a person. But when he sees the name of the mezuzah, Shaddai, that name that's written on the outside, when he sees that name, he cannot enter the house, so he stands on the outside of the house. Right? And therefore, a person, he says that he shouldn't put anything dirty next to the mezuzah, because once there's a disgrace to the mezuzah in that area, that causes that the demon will be able to enter because of the disgrace, due to the disgrace of the actual mezuzah. Right? And uh, not only that, he says also when a person goes in and out of the house, he should also kiss the mezuzah. When he first put up the mezuzah, he says, This is the gates for the, for the Borei Olam, for Hashem, and all the tzaddikim should come through here. Right? And if a person doesn't have chas for shalom, a mezuzah in his house, or he doesn't have a kosher mezuzah in his house, it creates access to demons and bad angels to be able to come in and to harm people over there. Right? So therefore, a person should be very careful that he says that a person... That uh, doesn't, you know, people today, they like to go cheap. They think you can get a kosher mezuzah for $20, $30, $40. It's not realistic. Just to buy the, the leather is $12. The case is another 2 $3, right? And then the guy who's sitting and writing it takes a few hours. And then there's a the guy that puts crowns on it, charges like $5. The guy who checks it afterwards charges another $5, $10. You already, there's a lot of people working here. There's a lot of work over here. Right, to say you get a kosher mezuzah for $50 is like a flea market. You're, you're playing with fire. You don't know what you're getting. Right? So there's people that don't put up mezuzahs in the house or people that don't care to have kosher mezuzahs in the house. They just buy whatever they can put and put it up. And he says that causes that the children could get sick. Has for shalom. And therefore, Mele says, Uchtaftam an mezuzot betech v'sharecha also mezuzot is the same letters as zaz mavet. It pushes away death. It pushes away bad decrease from a person's house. Right, also it says right after that, that a mezuzah also has the ability to make long life for a person and a person's children as well. Right, and not only that, it says because of the mitzvah of tzitzit and mezuzah that people are not careful with, people's children, all in chas v'shalom, could uh, go tragic when they're young, chas v'shalom. And therefore the people that are the rabbanim and other people that are in charge of the kila should make sure that the people have proper mezuzot on their doorposts. These also things that protect the person from evil. Not only that, there was a story one time, I forgot where this was. There was a story one time that uh, there was in the city there was a very big fire. There was a very big fire in the city. And only like select houses were not affected by the fire. And it found out that the same sofa that wrote the mezuzahs for all those houses were not affected by that fire. Just to point out the tremendous shmira that it has the ability to offer. And so the Lubavitch Rebbe also was very into this. And they used to come to Lubavitch Rebbe, people used to come with different problems, they used to always tell them, check your mezuzahs and check your tefillin, make sure everything is done right. right. Maybe one day we'll give a shir about writing a tefillin, writing mezuzah to see how complex everything is, is and so people can understand the bigger picture to be able to be able to put together what it should be and uh, in comparison to what they think it should be. Now we just mentioned one halakha. Uh, we're discussing here the laws of rebeat. I don't know how long more I'm going to discuss the laws of rebeat. Maybe another few weeks and then maybe we'll go on to a different topic. Topic, which one? I'm not sure yet. We'll figure it out when I get there. Well, we discussed one law when it comes to interest in loans. If I gave somebody money, say I gave somebody a $100,000 loan, and I told him I want him to pay me back $120,000. And we write out a contract. I am giving this individual $100,000. I want 20% interest on the loan, and he has to give me back $120,000. They have witnesses and so on and so forth. Now, the difference between a verbal loan and a loan written on a contract is the loan written on a contract uh, creates liens on the property. For example, if you give me a loan of $100,000, you have a lien on my property. Automatically, that loan and the contract creates a lien on whatever I own. That if I don't pay you, you have a lien on whatever I own. But a verbal loan, even though we both agree that I borrowed money from you, you don't have a lien on any of the properties when it comes to a verbal loan. Therefore, a contract is much stronger. So if we have a contract that has a loan that has interest on it, so, the, so now the question is, does the contract become invalidated? Does it make the contract not kosher because you're not allowed to pay interest? Right? How, could you have a, how could you have a contract with interest on it? The witnesses might not even be kosher on this, on this uh, contract. 
right? So it says like this. The Shulchan Aruch says that if the loan and the interest is separate, that it says $100,000 is the loan, $20,000 is the interest, the contract is still kosher. The witnesses do not become invalidated because most witnesses are not aware that there's an issue for them to be on this contract. Therefore, they don't become invalidated like Rishayim because generally a person that's a sinner is not kosher to be a uh, kosher witness. He cannot sign on anything, right? But here, since these people are not aware that the Savero could apply to them, for whatever the, the pasuk is, therefore the contract would be kosher if the loan and the interest is separate. And therefore the person can come and collect only from the loan and not the interest. However, if there's no indication that the loan and the interest on the document is different, rather it's just one sum, which is the loan and the interest put together, then it invalidates the loan. For example, if I write, I owe you $130,000, and the witness is signed, and then the base then finds out through the witnesses that really the loan was $100,000. But I'm paying you back $30,000 in interest. So the fact that I'm paying you back $30,000 in interest and it's one sum amount on the contract without differentiating what's what, that contract becomes invalidated and the base will not accept such a contract. And therefore the whole loan will just have to be verbal. Whatever I agree on that I took from you, right, without the interest, of course, that's what you will have to pay back. However... And uh, in, in both cases, whether or not I found a contract, that on this contract it has a loan and it has interest. Say there's a contract that has a loan and has interest. So we just said that the loan you could collect, the interest you cannot. What about if I find this contract and I know that it belongs to you? Do I have to return it? No. The Allah says you rip up the contract, you throw it in the garbage. Why? Because we're concerned that if you have a loan with interest on it and I'm going to take you to court or take you to base then, you might collect the interest from it as well. Since there's a potential Isidorita on this contract, we're concerned that people might fall into the sin with this contract, and therefore there's a mitzvah to rip up this contract. However, if you know that if you're going to rip up this contract, the next day the guy's going to break your legs, right? There you wouldn't, have to, there you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to rip up the contract, but you should be careful to try to maybe notify somebody that there is, this loan was done by Isim. People think that taking money and interest and all these things are very simple. It's a severe Isidoraita. That's one of the Avirot that the Chamim tell us a person doesn't get up after the Chiyat HaMetim. A person wants to make business investments, make a Heter Iska, or make terms which abide by a Heter, which abide by a Iska, which abide by an investment, not a loan. Right? Therefore, many other people need to be very careful when they give out loans. One more Allah will we'll discuss in regards to lending, letting people borrow things. For example, if I give you uh, a bag of potatoes, right, that it costs ten ninety nine, and uh, let's say the potato market goes up and down. Say there's a shortage on potatoes go up and down. I cannot give you a bag of potatoes telling you to give me a, that you're going to give me a bag of potatoes back. Because maybe when you give me those bag of potatoes back in two or three days, the, the price of it will go up and you're going to have to pay me more for what I initially gave you. However, that's what the Shulchan Aruch says. But today, there's a set market on a lot of the things. All these things have a set market. Right? Potatoes, eggs, all these things have a set market. So we're not concerned that if I give you a carton of eggs, it's going to go by a dollar in two days. There's no concern like that. Because usually everything stays the same price for a while before it could change up and down. So therefore, if I give you like a, a carton of eggs, then you give me a carton of eggs back in two days, not a problem. However, when do we have a problem? If I give you uh, a, cart, a carton of eggs that's small and you go give me a carton of eggs that's extra large, you give me a much more expensive and bigger carton of eggs, that becomes a problem of repeat. That you're not allowed. What? What's the... <coughs> yeah. So you make... You'd be losing. You have to make a hetter isko. Mm -hmm. Meaning to say, there's a certain country, there's a certain document in Jewish law that can, that makes this transaction into an investment that you're allowed to take back interest on. You're allowed to take back a percentage on it due to the investment that you're making. But to lend it and call it interest and make it interest, halachically is an issue of right. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to give money to somebody and expect them to pay back interest. Therefore, also, if I'll give you, right, if, I, if you come to my house and you tell me, oh, I forgot to get a bottle of wine, and I give you a bottle of wine. I give you a bottle of wine. But you have to make sure that you give me the same bottle of wine. Right? You can't give me something more expensive. 
Not unless I give it to you as a gift. You come to me, I say, hey, I give this to you. I don't need it back. You can take it, keep it. Right? And then you take it, right? And then you decide on your own to come and give me back something that's more expensive. That's okay. That's not considered a loan. So, you know, we'll stop here today. That's <laughs>